Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, so as we get started uh, with this seminar from the Global Leadership Series, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which the University of Queensland stands now, where I am today, the Turrbal and Yagara people. And though you may not be here with me, I gather we have attendees here from across the country and indeed across the globe. Um, I invite you to reflect on the traditional owners of the spaces where you find yourselves and to pay respects to their ancestors and their descendants, their lore, their stories, customs and creation spirits, and their continued cultural and spiritual connections to country. So we've come together today to discuss creativity in a time of crisis. And I'm reminded of that stories have a way of surviving through all manner of adverse conditions. So as Bruce Pascoe writes, the story is the most powerful thing on earth because it will last as long as there are two people left on it. And when there is only one, she will whisper these stories to remind herself of what has been lost. And in that way, she will have the company of her ancestors. In times of crisis, stories may comfort us. They may offer escape, knowledge, connection, mindfulness. But it can also be difficult to produce stories during a time of crisis, which is what our panel will be discussing today. My name is Helen Marshall, and I'm just going to put up a slide um, to introduce our speakers. So, as I was saying, my name is Dr. Helen Marshall, and I'm a member of the School of Communications and Arts here at the University of Queensland, where I teach creative writing and publishing. My first novel, The Migration, came out last year, and it rather ironically imagines a near future world in which young people around the world begin to contract a mysterious disease. It's a novel that deals with notions of the apocalypse, both those in our past and those that may still come. But nevertheless, it charts a hopeful path forward for a changed society. So I'm new to the University of Queensland, having arrived here exactly one year ago. And so I wanted to begin with a brief story of another crisis at my previous institution. On the day following the announcement of the results of the American election, I was teaching a group of writers at Anglia Ruskin University, and it was an evening class. The students had always been a lively bunch. They were eager, they were full of questions and comments and jokes, but that day they were silent. They were almost mournful, I suppose. Uh, so one of my colleagues had told me not to talk about politics, to just leave it out of the room. Um, but in the moment of stepping in front of them, that seemed impossible to me. So politics, whatever we believe, is at the heart of writing. It's a vital part of living and participating in a society. So I did the best thing I could think of in the situation, which is I cribbed something I'd heard from Ben Markowitz, a lecturer at Royal Holloway, uh, that the purpose of teaching creative writing is on the one hand to help students become published in the best cases, uh, but in all cases, regardless of the quality of writing, it's to help students become better witnesses to the world. And I've thought hard on that maxim since I first heard it, particularly this semester as I've had to help a cohort of talented students through a time of massive disruption. So we're all witnesses of the world. And even then, when that world seems constricted, the tools of storytelling can help us. They help us understand our world, observe it, process it. And this is a fundamentally imaginative act. It's an act with great power, the power to witness. Uh, so I'd like to thank the Global Leadership Series the School of Communication and Arts and the organizers and support staff behind this event for giving us the chance to discuss this important subject. And of course, I'd like to thank the two writers with me today who have, I think, both used their writing to act as witnesses, though in quite different ways. So Shannon Malloy graduated in 2006 from UQ with a bachelor in journalism, and he dove into an exciting and varied career that has ranged from public relations, media management, and digital reporting to strategizing and writing content for Amazon's Alexa. He now works as a senior reporter for news.com.au. Um, he's continued to be a valuable part of the UQ community. In 2017, he launched a journalism scholarship in memory of his friend and former journalist, Claire Atkinson, which provides work experience opportunities in Sydney media companies. And just a few months ago in April, Simon & Schuster released his debut memoir, 14, which describes a challenging but ultimately pivotal year in his search to understand his identity at an all boys rugby mad Catholic school in regional Queensland. So it's a raw and emotional, emotional account of violence, homophobic bullying threaded through with real moments of connection uh, with friends, uh, with Brooke Satchwell, with whom he did his first interview, and perhaps most importantly with his family, especially his mother. 
So reading your account, Shannon, I was really struck by the challenges that young people face today. And I'm interested in the way in which your own writing became a link to a wider world at a time when you must have felt really isolated. Um, and your recollections of discovering internet chat rooms and platforms such as ICQ seem so vividly familiar to me. Um, I remember that time in my life when suddenly the internet offered the ability to connect to diverse people across the globe, how exciting it felt. Um, and now we have something like that, um, but on steroids, don't we? And so speaking of connecting across the globe, I'm so delighted to be able to welcome Joy Rhodes, who is joining us today from London, England, where she lives now. Joy was, bo was born in Roma, in Western Queensland, with an early memory of flat country and a broad sky. She studied law and literature at the University of Queensland, and her work as a lawyer took her first to Sydney, and then all over the world, to London, Hong Kong, Singapore, Tokyo, and New York. The Wool Grower's Companion, her first book, was a bestseller, inspired in part by snippets of her grandmother's life and times, a fifth generation grazier, and a gentle teller of stories of her life on her family's sheep farm. It's a passionate and compassionate account that demonstrates how fiction can offer an avenue for bearing witness by reworking and reimagining our own histories. And her second novel, The Burnt Country, is its sequel. So I'm going to stop sharing. You can all see our lovely faces. All right. Um, so thank you very much, Joy and Shannon, for joining us today. Um, I thought that maybe we would start uh, with some questions about process, because I found that one of the things that the coronavirus has introduced is real challenges in terms of the way we go about our daily lives, um, and challenges that have changed even over the course of these months. So I wondered if you could start by talking a little bit about when you write and how you write. Uh, Joy, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, thank you, Helen. I try to write every day if I possibly can, but that often is, is just not possible. Life interferes. I do think regularity to writing is really good, really. And I teach writing at, at London libraries and I say to students, try to build it into your day. And for me, that means before work and it's quiet. One of the wonderful unintended consequences of COVID is that I'm at home. I don't have that commute. And so it's suddenly I have an hour that I would have spent on the tube, um, which is free. Uh, well, as free as it can be at home, right? With, with, with kids coming and going. So that's when I try to write. It's quiet and I'm fresh. I find that's the best time to try to, um, to write. And what about you, Shannon? Do you have a regular schedule? Uh, well, I, I write every day in, as part of my day job, uh, and that has been quite different and challenging over the past few months. We shut down our entire newsroom uh, at the end of March and all went to working from home, which is totally unprecedented. Uh, it was a little bit easier for us digitally, but for, for our cousins in the newspaper part of our business, it was the first time in history that, that products had been produced uh, off-site. It was pretty extraordinary. And even though technology has allowed us to do so much now, it was still extremely complex. Uh, and, and just sort of from a creative perspective, um, in a journalistic sense, lacking that office banter and the ability to have conversations about different ideas and, and changing, you know, the, the focus of stories and responding to really quickly moving uh, events was was such a loss and, and I really struggled personally with not having that connection with people. Um, from a personal perspective, when it comes to writing that I like to do in my own time, mostly just for fun because my books only just come out, um, I found that, that I didn't really have the energy for it. After writing for 10 hours about almost nothing but coronavirus for two months from home, not leaving the house, uh, and having no one to talk to except, you know, my very annoying puppy. Uh, I sort of just wanted to have a glass of wine or three and go to sleep. So I wasn't really writing a great deal, um, but I found that that has changed in the past couple of weeks as restrictions here have eased. As I've returned to the office, as you can see behind me, um, I, I find that there's a bit more bandwidth in my own sort of, you know, a slightly less, uh, congested frame of mind to be able to start writing again. And for me, the time I love to do that is in the sort of 45 minutes before I go to sleep. I jump into bed, 
uh, get warm at the moment uh, with the cat and, uh, and sort of just jot down thoughts about the day, things that have been on my mind, good or bad, um, ideas that I've got. Um, even if I'm not sort of feeling particularly inspired, I like to do a bit of a to-do list for the next day just so that I'm, I'm in that habit of writing something, anything. Uh, and I find that that's sort of, it's a nice way to end the day as well. I think I admire both of your uh, structures. I tend to be a bit more of a free form writer in that I can go for stretches of about three weeks, I think when I have a rigid schedule and I manage to write all the time and then um, something will end up kind of disrupting it and throwing me out of it for a little bit. Uh, so um, I think I found the first six weeks of lockdown much easier in some ways as an introvert, uh, where I suddenly found having a lot of the distractions cut away. And there was this sort of beautiful time where I felt really, really focused and able to connect to people because I suppose as part of teaching, I felt suddenly like I was in a position where actually people around me really wanted my creative writing expertise. And by that, I sort of mean my nieces who are nine years old, uh, who were suddenly without, um, without teachers. And so I started uh, writing novels with them. Um, but then I found the sort of, after six weeks, I think I just hit kind of a point of burnout and maybe lack of inspiration or, or lack of kind of a changing environment. Um, but Shannon, you've just had your book come out. And uh, I think all of our hearts go out to you because it must have been such a challenge to, to not only kind of face the disruption of of COVID-19, but to face it while you were in the process of trying to launch a book. So uh, we haven't spoken about five weeks. So how has that gone? Um, it was it was funny. Uh, the sort of running joke amongst my mates is that if something can go wrong with me, it will. And so it was sort of just classically Shannon timing that uh, a week before my book came out, we had to cancel a, a four week multi-city tour uh, with multiple events and appearances and uh, and all things that were meant to to get my book out there uh, and so for the first week or two of what was meant to be this sort of you know lifelong dream achieved, I was quite melancholy and uh, and sort of felt like i I was grieving this thing that never happened um, but then amazingly. Well, it probably makes sense. Um, everyone was at home looking for something to read. And so uh, once there was a little bit of momentum uh, with a couple of initial press stories about the book, it really just took off from there. And, uh, and it's been so, so lovely to, um, to see it out in the world, even though it's not at all how we imagined it might come out. Um, people are, are reading it and connecting with it. Um, and and it's the kind of a nice side effect is that I've, I've had all this time to connect with those people in a way that perhaps I wouldn't if I'd been out on the road for four weeks. Um, and so I can respond to emails. I've, I've even gone to a couple of people's book clubs on Zoom and, you know, dropped in and talked to five people about my book. Like that would not have happened. Um, so it's been really nice and the, the response has been fantastic. Oh, that's, that's really lovely to hear, I think. And I mean, I think it's a perfect book for it too, because it's, uh, you know, there's such kind of a story of triumph, uh, which I think is the kind of thing um, that, uh, that, that many people are drawn to right now. Uh, so have, have you guys noticed changes in your reading habits at all, I wonder? Well, certainly I initially, I, I found I couldn't read. I, you know, um, I... And, and the, it, was a, it was a very difficult time, frankly. I, th I was in New York over 9-11. I was living in New York and I had these bizarre, you know, it was all coming back. It was awful. I think it was because the streets were empty and they, the only vehicles in the streets were ambulances and sirens and, that, and, it was this, and there was this fear, you know, when you had to go out to shop and that all felt horribly familiar. And so that it took me about a month to sort of readjust and reset and and recognize that this is something else it's terrible and big but it's you know everything will be okay this too will pass uh, so i didn't read really for that month and then uh, wonderfully i have a book club and um you know i belong to a book club and it it grew out of a bookshop here in london and so it's a, a tr tremendously 
quirky, interesting group. And um, they continue to meet on Zoom. And we were reading Madame Bovary, which I have to say, I didn't finish. But um, the idea that you, you have to read and even the, the discipline of thinking, why don't I like this? You know, that's what I say to my writing students. What is it about a book that's not working for you? And why, how would you avoid that in your own work? And I think maybe it's whole variety of different reasons we won't get into Madame Bovary but um, so I wasn't reading for a while I, I am um, slowly coming back into it I do think um, I'm drawn more to books like Shannon's in the sense that you want something uplifting you want um, a story which envelops you which transports you but which comforts you and that I think that's from what I can gather that's very much reflected in in book sales people are they're not looking right now for dystopian novels. Not right now. I'm sure that will come, but uh, not at the moment. I agree. And, and I was very similar in that, uh, you know, I didn't have much mental capacity to do, you know, much more than watch a really trashy Netflix series and have a wine and, and go to sleep. And so I didn't read much. Uh, for a long time. And then uh, I started reading uh, Julia Baird's book, Phosphorescence, which it's sort of, uh, it's almost like she had a psychic premonition about what the world was going to be going through as her book was released. And hers came out, I think, a week before mine. And so her entire schedule and launch was, was cancelled as well. But it's just this most, the most beautiful book about how to sort of look for you know, the inner happiness when it seems impossible and, uh, you know, stories of joy and strength. Um, and I'm only about halfway through, uh, but it was just, it was like a godsend. It was the perfect book for me to be able to, to get into. Um, and yeah, I agree. I think it was just, it's the sort of book that people are looking for right now. It's, it's a, it's not, <laughs> It's sort of substantial escapism, I suppose. There's, you know, there's a payoff there, but it's not, it's not going to haunt your dreams after you <laughs> put it down for the night and go to sleep. So apologies for that. Uh, one of the challenges of Zoom is that, uh, you know, aspects of your, your real life uh, impinge, in which case this is that I'm, I'm in a room that has uh, time sensitive lights. So if I don't do a little waggle dance, um, they turn off on me. Uh, but I, I found uh, I found initially I could only go back to kind of comfort reads from my childhood. So I reread a lot of the books that I had really loved when I was 15 or 16. Um, and normally I like really weird literary naughty texts, um, naughty with a K texts. And, uh, and I couldn't manage to, uh, to read any of them. So I went back to these books that I had really loved. And I think there was an element of escapism in it, definitely. Um, I found it a little bit harder to watch TV, in part because everybody was doing things on TV that I was no longer able to do. And I felt that weird kind of disconnect um, when you see two people, uh, I don't know, meeting for the first time and, and shaking hands and you think, not allowed to do that, are you? <laughs> it's a bit unsafe. Um, or when you see somebody get on a plane and go somewhere and you think, and you sort of feel this, um, I suppose this sense of being in a parallel universe where you're watching characters who you know from, a, from an ongoing TV show who are living in a world that doesn't have COVID-19. Um, and I found that really strange initially. Um, so one of the things that I found kind of grounded me and kind of opened up a space for creativity was a uh, connection to friends and family, which was kind of radically reshaped. I um, mean, in some ways, uh, some very positive ways, because having just moved over to Australia, while well, I suddenly realized I might not be able to see my family for potentially years, um, everybody was suddenly moved into a position of needing to learn how to use Skype and Zoom. And so I got a lot more regular contact with them. Um, but what did you guys do for a sense of connection or maybe to get some of that, um, to get some of that creative energy, Shannon, that you were talking about that you found that you were missing from the newsroom? Um, so in a sort of professional setting, we, um, we communicated via chat. Um, but that was that was quite difficult and had its own sort of you know it's it's quite often not easier or, or quicker to say nothing than it is to type out a message to someone 
Um, but to, to try and keep sort of morale up in the newsroom, we had regular sort of video calls where we'd all jump on and, and have a beer together, you know, in our own living rooms for 15 minutes or something and, and you know, talk nonsense or play a quick quiz. Um, but personally, I found that I went back to what I loved to do the most when I was sort of 12 and 13, and that was, you know, sit on the couch and have an hour-long conversation on the phone with, with an old friend. Um, and it's sort of strange, like, a, you know, I have a, a smartphone, but I rarely use it to make telephone calls. Uh, and that has all changed now. It's, I much preferred to hear someone's voice and to, you know, talk about the old times, uh, you know, of not a year ago when we could travel and, and catch up in person. Um, and so it was great. I would sort of sit at the end of a, a, a pretty harrowing day most days uh, at about six or seven o'clock and, and talk for an hour on the phone with, you know, someone I went to uni with, someone I grew up with, um, people I haven't had the time to talk to for that, that length of time in a long time. It was sort of, it was beautiful that, you know, this, this thing that kept us apart also, for me anyway, gave me time that I would never ordinarily have to, to reconnect. So I really liked that element of it. Um, I, don't, I don't love the video chat thing. I feel quite self-conscious on camera. So, <laughs> um, so I tended to just stick to telephone calls rather than, than video calls. But um, yeah, that's how I stayed. That's how I stayed sort of connected. And I wrote a couple of letters as well, which again is something that I haven't done in Yonks, but I love to do. I sort of sat down in the sun in my courtyard. Um, that was the furthest I could go from my house uh, and write a letter to someone that, that I missed. Um, and, I'm, you know, I'm a mummy's boy, but it was my mum. So, <laughs> so I wrote my mum a letter. A, a, a very much the same. The, the, you know, the the wonderful thing, if there is anything wonderful to come out of COVID, is a real uh, sort of a clarification for me about the importance of friendships. And I've talked to people that I haven't spoken to, you know, regularly for a long time, and it's a wonderful thing. And, you know, the terrible part about COVID is that we're all... Um, you know, where I, I feel very lucky to be suffering in the lightest way that I am. You know, if my, my biggest problem is that I'm not really able to go outside, I'm incredibly lucky, particularly given the, 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 the sad deaths in the huge number of deaths in the UK. So that, um, that desire to reach out to friends and to talk to them and to catch up with them has been, it's just been, <clears throat> excuse me, fantastic. Um, I've also, I am, you know, I teach my classes for the library and I usually do them in person. And so we have a finite number of people we can get into library rooms. But with, with, um, with COVID, the library said to me, please, can you do them on Zoom? And I said, yes, absolutely happy to do that. Thinking, can we do that? And it, it's worked really very well. And what I'm finding is that rather than the catchment areas of the London libraries, which is usually the, you know, my sort of stamping ground, um, it's, we, it's wide open. So we have the, I taught a session on Monday night and we had people from Poland on, people from New York. And I think it's a desire to connect. You know, there is that strong urge, both not just with family and friends, but also from a creative perspective. And that's been enormously helpful for me because I am a huge proponent of creative writing for mental health. You know, that you, you may never hit the top of the New York Times bestseller list, list, but you will be a happier, more grounded, more fulfilled person if you pursue your art more regularly. So from my perspective, the, um, the wonderful thing about sort of teaching the classes is that that connection clearly that thirst for some sort of creative community so it's been it's been wonderful it's helped my concentration because it's meant that i'm very aware that there are so many people with a desire to create and it is as, as you said when we began helen our voices you know if everyone is able to give force to what they want to say then we communicate better you know it sounds very trite but i think it's it puts us in a better place both personally and as a community 
Absolutely. And, you know, Shannon, you talk as well about um, writing and its connection to, to well-being in your book. Have you, do you, have you found that writing has been a useful tool for well-being during this time? Definitely. Um, again, not in a professional sense because it's all been about coronavirus um, up until recently. Um, although the, the thing that replaced that wasn't close in either, it was the the Black Lives Matter movement, which has been, you know, just as traumatic to to witness um, from afar as a journalist. Um, but personally, even just those mundane things that I spoke about before, like, you know, the a recap of the day, the things that I'm grateful for, what I'm planning on doing tomorrow, as well as more creative things, um, has been such a huge um, benefit for me. It's sort of you know, it kind of breaks the the flow of, of the day if it's been really challenging. It, it's a nice way to reflect on the good and the bad and, and the difficult. Um, and it's a nice way to set up my sort of framework for the next day. Um, and so that's been really good, you know, more beneficial than it normally is um, during this time. Um, and, uh, and that's something that I've always found, like you sort of alluded to, uh, you know, in my book, I talk a lot about this awful year that I experienced when I was 14 and, and writing being an escape from that for me, whether it was short stories or my early sort of foray into journalism. Writing for me has always been a connection to, um, you know, daydreaming, to inspiration and to hope um, for something bigger and better. And, and for me in the past few months, that's certainly been, been the case. So I suppose maybe on that, uh, on the question of hope, uh, I think many of us observed that uh, the creative industries have had real challenges uh, over the past months. Um, and yet it also seems in some ways as if uh, the creative industries have kind of um, stood at the center of various aspects of well-being. So whether it's kind of entertainment or forms of teaching or forms of contextualizing or envisioning what the future might look like afterwards. Um, how do you imagine the arts maybe playing a role in recovery uh, after? So, I mean, I, I, I worry a great deal about the short term. Um, uh, most writers make their living in another way. Sorry, I can hear a, an echo. Um, so most writers make their, their living in another way. And so everybody has a day job, for want of a better word. And the most, of, most people work as freelancers or temps or part-time. And that is the area of work where um, people are suffering most badly in the sense that that's where the layoffs of course are the most significant so i i do worry that you know and and already fiction was not diverse uh really there's no way you can say it is and so the difficulty is that there will be a short-term and a medium-term impact it seems to me because voices will be silenced simply because people can't get work and i'm seeing it already with writer friends freelancers who are having difficulty so there is that sort of um, short term and, and incredibly important um, issue. Um, but having said that, creativity has to help us get through this, whether it's on a micro level or a, a macro level. You know, there will be beautiful books written about this. Um, I found that it, I think, though, it takes time to process it, just as it took me time to figure out, you know, why I was so disturbed irrationally disturbed um when it when everything first happened so it is i think with all of us we slowly process what's happening around us and then we shift to a kind of a new normal and then another new normal and i think the the books that will come out of it and there will be books and films and and all kinds of fabulous things that will come but it will take time um, i'm i'm certainly finding my creativity is is sort of manifesting itself in in different ways i've been promising students for years that i would do a a podcast and i've on creative writing and i finally did it you know uh in 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 lockdown i've started it i also helped a 
um, a company do a podcast for the unemployed, literally six sessions on everything from your CV to LinkedIn to uh, um, interviews to negotiation. And it's very much a how to because we anticipate that there are going to be literally hundreds of thousands of people out of work who may not have been out of work for many years. So it's creative in the sense that I'm editing for them. I'm um, literally acting as a quasi journalist, Shannon. So that sort of creativity in some ways is, is not, you know, is it, is it my third book? No, but it, it, I'm finding that I have a, a, a desire to be creative in almost in new ways and very much in, in the pursuit of service, you know, I, I want to contribute and I see that everywhere. Everybody wants to help. Um, and so whatever that might be, whatever your thing is, how can you, you know, shape that in a way that it helps someone? So I, I worry about the creative industries in the short term. I worry about all those unemployed people. And I also see that they, they you know, that creativity and thoughtfulness will help us through it but how and when it's a it's a watch this space i agree and and just by the sort of very nature of of this virus it's it's unpredictable and we don't know very much about it so who can who can say what's what's coming um i am i'm terrified as well for the for the creative industries um, the impact here in Australia has been significant and there's been next to no government assistance mm -hmm. for those workers who are all freelancers or contractors or casuals and don't, unfortunately, don't qualify for any of the money that's, that's out there. And I've seen mates of mine from, you know, television down to um, authors um, impacted by this in very real ways. Um, and so I think there's going to be a kind of creative drought for a little while once we are through this. Um, the sort of, the optimistic part of me uh, might be a little naive is, um, is sort of hoping that the resilience that I think characterises a lot of people in creative fields, I hope that that, that gets us through. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of, I say we while I'm sitting here in my full-time job, but you know, creative people mostly are, are used to getting by on the smell of an oily rag and, and hopefully that sustains us, you know, God willing, depending on what comes. And then once we're through that, hopefully the other characteristic of creative people, you know, making beautiful art out of um, trying times and adversity, hopefully we see the benefit of that as well. Um, who knows, it's, you know, it's June, I think, uh, and uh, and we'll see what we'll see where we are in six months' time. Hopefully, in a vastly different space for for all of our sakes. But um, I think in the short, I agree. In the short term, uh, it's it's probably not going to be pretty. And Joy, I was really struck by your sense of um, people wanting to serve, uh, and that's definitely something that I've been observing as well, and I've strongly felt. Um, I felt it uh, really strongly through my teaching, um, where suddenly that snapped into focus as a way to connect to people and, and even using the teaching of creative writing as a way to help them connect and maybe process what they were going through. Um, and uh, myself and one of my colleagues, uh, Kim Wilkins, sort of put together an impromptu project called uh, Postcards for Future Queensland, which I'll give a brief plug for, um, it which was intended for high school students and university students to be able to write postcards from a better future Queensland um, back to themselves. So we offered a series of uh, writing challenges and uh, little writing lessons that um, went through them. So we're doing our last set of them over the next two weeks. Uh, so if you're interested, do check them out. But it really did come out of that sense of both wanting to help people to, to ease the load on teachers a little bit who are also like us struggling to um, to frame what was happening and uh, to adapt quickly to provide new content. And I think that there's, I think that there's space for that kind of work to be able to serve in a variety of ways. Uh, so we're going to open the floor to questions. Uh, so do feel free to put questions into your Q&A box. Um, but while you're maybe beginning to add those questions in, um, 
do you guys want to maybe share a piece of advice you might have for somebody who is newly trying to write uh, during this phase or somebody who might be struggling to write during this phase? Well, I think on the struggling to write, you know, we're all struggling to write. I, I think, uh, but I do, and I think particularly now, there's no question. I, I tend to like a fairly stable environment um, because the, it, you know, writing requires such energy and, so you to be to transport yourself and to reduce that to to words requires real for me intensity and focus and concentration so i need everything else to be largely humming along in a in a stable fashion to be able to do that that's not happening so it's especially hard and that's not unique so many friends are uh, particularly in the first month were really really having difficulty um having said that i I do think that part of being a writer, it sounds really obvious, it's just writing. And I say this to students, just write. You know, you can't afford to wait for the muse to strike you because that's not going to happen. And I remember um, being in an event in New York and a writer saying, you know, my father was a truck driver and he never had truck driver's block. And I thought, you know, that's it. That's it. We can't, we can't be precious about writing. And frankly, I would say to students, the hard work is in the editing. Get the words on paper because the, that getting down is actually easy. It's the combing and the honing and the, you know, trying to turn that into something beautiful that, that the real heavy lifting is at. So I think stay with it and, and, and write regularly. I, I saw a really sad thing recently. That's the, the drop-off rate in books, I'm not going to be able to find it, is um, most writers don't, most writers stop after two or three books. And it's only something like five, four or five percent who make it way up to sort of 10 or 12 books. So part of writing is staying with it and recognizing that it's incredibly hard incredibly hard on a on a sort of micro level and incredibly hard on a macro level hard to get an agent hard to get a publisher hard to find an audience so it's all hard you know that's normal well done you if you can stay with it because that will distinguish you from others so part of me is like that's my only advice is keep writing and take your craft seriously I agree. Um, and it's one of the things that I did when I wrote my book. Um, I had a pretty short deadline to get it done. It was just over five months and I'd pretty much written nothing uh, when, I, when I got the deal. So I had five months to, to do 80,000 words and I did it um, while still working. Um, so I would just schedule time in the morning and the evening and on the weekends to, to just write. Um, I sort of had my own take on the on the famous saying, you know, write drunk, edit sober. Um, mine was <laughs> write shit and refine later. So even if it was crap or I didn't feel inspired at all, I just sort of made myself write. Uh, and I didn't edit as I went along because I knew I would get stuck in my own head. I knew that I would hate what I did in the moment. Uh, and I waited until much later to go through it. And even if it was... 80% garbage or 90% garbage, that's probably a generous estimation. Um, there might have been an idea in there or the kernel of an idea that I could latch onto. Um, and so that's what I that's what I did. And it's kind of what I, do, what I sort of have to do as, as the truck driver of, of writing, being a journalist. Um, you know, there are many days when I'm not inspired at all. Um, or horrifically hungover um, and have to have to just make it work and so you sort of just start and, and quite often making a start whether it be the start of a 30 minute writing session outside in the sun or the 20 minutes at the end of the day just starting is is sometimes the toughest step and it doesn't have to be brilliant you know nothing we we do has to be brilliant um, all the time yeah, I often find that uh, beginning the process of writing is a little bit like trying to get into a cold pool, but not like a cold pool on a hot day, like a cold <laughs> pool on a cold day. Um, where Sometimes you really, you just have to jump in and then you sort of panic for a little bit, um, but it eventually starts to feel a little bit better and a little bit more comfortable. Um, and, and maybe part of writing is actually kind of learning how to be comfortable with discomfort. Um, mm -hmm. 
and learning how to be comfortable with uh, with that sense that yeah, either it's it's hard and it kind of stays consistently hard. I mean, you get really good days and you get really nice moments, um, but I don't I don't know that it ever feels progressively easier. But I think that also one of the benefits of that is once you know that you realize that you're not failing or you're not feeling like you're failing because you actually are failing. It's it's because that's what the process feels like to some extent, some of the time. And so once you realize that the challenges that you have on any given day, which might be, you know, family distractions, work distractions, trying to figure out how to schedule time in your day, even for, you know, professional writers, those are still the sets of challenges that they're trying to face. So rather than thinking about them as blocks, um, if you think about those as those are the things that you're always going to be having to deal with, then you can start figuring out strategies to be able to tackle it. Um, why don't we turn to some of the questions uh, we've got from our audience. Um, so uh, let's start with, uh, do you find it easier to write about fact or fiction right now? Wow, well, gosh, um, fiction is, you know, not quite as strange as nonfiction at the moment. Um, so, oh gosh, I don't know. Um, I'm not sort of really working on, on either, um, apart from just covering the news, but um, I find just, you know, silly little things that I jot down um, coming to me much easier than, than covering real world events, which are just sort of, you know, seemingly unendingly bad. Uh, so I think that that element of escapism is coming to me much easier now than perhaps it ordinarily would. Um, and of course, I haven't, I haven't written a fiction book. I, I wrote a memoir, which is sort of, you know, a lazy book, perhaps. Um, but uh, no, no, no. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm, I'm really, I'm liking, even if that's brief at the end of the day, just sort of going wherever my mind takes me. Um, you know, perhaps it's going to crazy places because the world is a bit crazy, who knows? And I'm finding, you know, my um, my um, full-time job is as a, a lawyer and I'm, I'm so lucky to have it in the sense that it enables me to write. And um, I, I write, um, my, my job is to write uh, regulatory and compliance policy. So it involves lots of research and lots of writing. So it's just perfect. Um, and I, you know, is it, is it writing fact? Not really, but it's very, it's very focused. And there is a release about that because I'm not having to think about what's going on and what the future might look like. So it's, it's funny, I'm finding it very bizarrely nourishing. You know, if you think about it, writing policy, uh, regulatory policy, why would that be nourishing? But I think it's because it's very, it's very certain. And it's based on laws, some of which are very old, some of which are very new. But it's a, it's a like, yes, this is normality. This was normality, and I'm, I'm. This is normal. I feel normal. Um, so that gives me a bizarre sense of comfort, and also frees me up to be able to write fiction. What I am finding, though, is a little bit to your point, Helen, uh, when we started, which is, as I write a scene, I'm thinking. Well, no, they, you know, immediately, you know, if they're walking along, so this, my third book is set in, in Richmond in Southwest London. And I'm thinking, okay, they're walking along uh, the, the Thames path just near Ham House. And I'm thinking, well, actually, no, because I, well, I can't have that many people. I'm like, yes, you can. It's 1948. It's fine. So there is a real, it's incredible to me how much COVID has completely um, penetrated the way we look at the world. So from a historical fiction writer's perspective, it's a it's lovely to be able to write that, but I have to rethink. I have to reset and recognise that that was then. You know what it has done is made me think a lot about books set during either of the plagues. You know, I suddenly my kids studying the plague and so on. I'm like, I'm like, wow, the the wiping out of population suddenly makes so much more terrible and tragic sense. So I think it's you know the 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 fact that I'm writing, the, the regulatory policy that I'm writing is, is reassuring, but the, there's no question that, you know, writing fiction is, is impinged by everything that's, that's going on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I found, I've got two novels on the go at the moment, one that's at the, one that's got a second draft together that requires revision and one that I've 
started sort of in between. Um, but the, the one that's at the beginning phase uh, was supposed to be near future science fiction about people going to Mars. Um, and it was, the idea behind it was I wanted to write something hopeful set in a, a future in which we managed to mitigate the worst effects of climate change. And I wanted to use it explicitly to think through how we could do that. So I had a vision in my own mind of what that path could look like. Um, but of course, when I started writing it, there, there had been no coronavirus. And when you're trying to write near future, uh, you know, you suddenly have to take into account the things that are happening, particularly if they're major events. And so in some ways, I'm quite glad to have that one on hold for the moment, because I don't know how to write about the future at the moment. Uh, so in fact, my sort of fantasy world uh, story feels a lot easier to write because I don't have to kind of come to grips with the reality in the sense of not knowing. And that's one of the interesting things I found when I've talked to some of my students who are in a genre, write, genre fiction writing class, so some of whom are writing science fiction, um, but they're trying to figure out, uh, you know, how do you write near future at all right now? We don't know what the future is going to look like. And how do, so how do you write without that feeling like it becomes out of gate very, very quickly? Um, but also we don't even know how to write about the present because in some ways we don't have a really clear sense of what's happening in other places and the, the stories of COVID-19 will really kind of come out, you know, as we've been talking about over the next 10 years, we will have a clearer sense of what has happened. So even at the moment it feels difficult to write the present. So I've, some writer friends I've talked to have started setting their books sort of three years ago to be able to write with a sense of normality. But I wonder how we're, how we're all going to do that, sort of knowing what lies ahead for our characters right around the corner. Um, so let's turn to some of these other questions that we have. Um, we have a question about uh, social media playing out in the creative world of writing. Uh, so do you feel that the coronavirus has had an effect on the way that social media is functioning at the moment? I think um, from my observations, it's, it's been probably more useful than it ever has, um, which isn't saying a great deal perhaps, but people have been, <laughs> one of the things I noticed within sort of days of the lockdowns coming into effect were these little communities popping up on Facebook that, you know, I'm in a bunch of them, but there was one that we called Quarantine Q and it was sort of people sharing recipes, people running online trivia on Zoom, people doing, you know, the, the Sunday quiz, newspaper quiz together on video chat. Um, there were all those sorts of things that, that popped up that were very community driven, that were very pleasant, which is such an, a, you know, a rare find on Facebook and Twitter these days. Um, I think people really rallied together and, and that's, that's what social media allowed them to do much better than perhaps it would have. Um, also just the sharing of basic information. Um, you know, what's the current restrictions on this? Can I drive to, you know, the beach 20 minutes away or is that still not allowed? Um, so I found it really um, refreshing. It sort of restored a little bit of my cynical hope in in these platforms and what they contribute to humanity. <laughs> I didn't think it was much, but here we are. Um, so I've really enjoyed it. From a creative perspective, it's also been kind of, I don't know, it's, as a journalist, I'm always intrigued by people's personal stories and their personal experiences, particularly through adversity. And for me, being able to witness that in sort of stark uh, terms again and again and again, whether it be, my mate in London, who an Aussie who lost her job and had to decide whether she came home in the sort of 48 hour window that she had before the flight stopped or whether she stayed and tried to make a go of it. Whether it was my friend's sort of daily chronicling of, of her horrific experience of trying to get to Eastern Europe where her and her husband are having a baby via surrogate um, with the borders closed and the planes grounded. Uh, and she got there with an hour to spare of the baby being born um, at extraordinary cost. But still, like seeing, seeing that for me, 
these very real and, and candid and, and more so than social media sort of normally allows, I think, because we're all a bit vulnerable, was just a reminder of, of the complexity of humanity, the power of storytelling and, and the simple sort of premise of it that we all have stories to share. Uh, and so for me, it was, it was all kinds of things. It was beautiful and reassuring and, and sad and, and uplifting. Uh, and just from a sort of, you know, my, my professional instinct to be a voyeur, it was also just fascinating. And that, I think that's, you know, as right as you, you know, scratch the surface and that's what you find, right? You find a storyteller and you find a watcher. I'm, I was an inveterate um, eavesdropper on the tube all the time <laughs> on conversations because you, oh, you're thinking, really? And the, so, uh, so I think, and this time has meant with people at home, there's, people have more time for social media. So I've found... Um, I wonder, one of my wonderful sisters has set up a WhatsApp group and with all the grandmas and the whole shebang and we share a lot more in an extended family way than we ever would have, which is a lovely thing. I feel, you know, living in London, I feel a lot more connected with Australian family because of that. So th th there's that at a very personal level. And then, you know, on, on Twitter, I'm seeing there is real support for, um, for um, for initiatives to change, you know, this business about service. So, I, I and I, that's so so hopeful for me. I, I think um, the idea, the Black Lives Matter movement, has been played out in, in in you know in sort of in real time, and I I feel better um, and and more hopeful, and it's from an equality perspective in a that than I ever have it's a and you know I lived in New York for nine years I, I I'm Australian you know I have um I sort of feel like there are so many conversations and an action that needs to come out of those conversations and that that is certainly particularly in London um and it's slowly slowly starting to happen so that gives me real uh, at least a, a sense of of hopefulness. I, I do think too, um, social media has, uh, as you say, Shannon, there's that, there's that vulnerability to us all at the moment because we are at home, we're in our houses. And uh, so, so people are coming into our, our lives in a way from a work perspective that, that hadn't happened before. Cats are climbing over things, you know, it's kind of normal. So I do think we're reassessing and, and because we're facing, you know, this sort of perfect storm of incredibly real risk outside our doors and um, great vulnerability because of the enormous change. So that mix means I think that both on a, on a family and friends uh, level, we are connecting more, but also people are, as I said, uh, wanting to serve and wanting to, wanting, uh, I think are being much more willing to stand up and say, I don't accept that. I want to have that conversation. And that's why I feel hopeful, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So thinking about hope again and uh, and how we sort of strive, I think, towards hopefulness while possibly at the same time acknowledging the real risks that are around us um, and, and the possibility for continued bad things to happen. So for change to be potentially negative as we go forward. Um, we have a question about how, how do you write something hopeful when you find that your mood is switching all the time, um, possibly between hopefulness to normality and sadness, anxiety, and frustration, possibly in the space of about 10 minutes or so. <laughs> um, and maybe we'll use this as our last question. So, um, so I'm a boring plotter, right? I'm, there's the whole, are you a plotter? Are you a pantser fly by the seat of your pants? Or are you a plantser, a bit of both? And I'm probably a plantser. But the beauty of plotting for me is that you see your narrative arc. You know where you're going. Frankly, in my experience, you never go where you think you know where you're going, but at least you have a map and you feel better about it. So I find that discipline means that I, I can write towards a hopeful conclusion. Everything I write whether it's short stories or, or um, both my books and the book I'm working on is, has, has very much a redemptive element, an element of, I hope, um, uh, both, a, both a, you know, sort of road markers to change 
uh, as well as the the development of the character. So for me, I think um, plotting, boring, boring, boring old plotting, because it's so unfashionable, um, really provides a means by which I can reach for hopefulness, even though I am genuinely worried about the short term and the medium term. One of the things that I, I did a lot with my book um, was to to kind of look at it in in different um, ways. I'm I'm probably not going to explain this very well, but in sort of simple sense, in a simple sense, um, you know, this book is about one of the worst years of my life, if not the worst year. And when I started writing it, I didn't think that there were any positive or happy elements in that year. I thought it was just all terrible uh, and that's why I wanted to write a book about it you know it was kind of a compelling story um, and of course the, the very quick feedback from my publisher as they sort of started seeing sample chapters was you know this is depressing people are gonna are gonna go mad uh, so look for happy things and so I started doing um, kind of like looking at individual horrific events and and as a starting point trying to figure out what i'd learned from that either in the weeks that followed in the months that followed in the, in the year that followed or now in the 20 years that have passed what have i learned from that was there any silver lining in it and that sort of helps me start to build up you know th this foundation of of hope and then i just did really situational things like um listen to music from that period of time exclusively for, for five or six months and nothing else. And that sort of took me back to, you know, the, the funny dance that I made up with a friend at that period of time. And then I started to think about our friendship together. And, and then I started to think about, you know, the time that she reassured me that life was never going to be like this forever. Um, and so that sort of started, you know, this, this breadcrumb exercise, if you like, of, you know, seeing a, a little tiny glimmer of something and then, and then scraping towards it until it revealed more of itself. Um, and also, I, I think just I would say very quickly that, you know, you don't, you don't have to write something hopeful. You could write about what's happening to you right now or or be inspired to write a sort of fictional story about what's happening now. It doesn't necessarily have to be immediately hopeful or be the thing that gives the world hope that we're all going to be okay. Um, you know, sometimes relatable stories that strike a chord and that, that create change that, that, you know, resonate with people are difficult stories. Um, and maybe in the process of telling that you'll find uh, some element of optimism to weave in there or not. Sometimes sad stories are, are great too. <laughs> um, did you see the notebook? That was pretty sad. Um, 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 so, uh, I don't know. Don't overthink it too much um, and just take the inspiration wherever it comes. I found myself, I found in, myself both in both in what I was reading and in terms of what I was writing, just uh, feeling a real interest in joy and trying to find what the joy was in the book. So at any given scene, what was the thing that a reader might feel joyful about or what might I feel joyful about writing? And, uh, and sometimes also kind of developing maybe a deeper compassion for my characters. I do think that one of the things that has come out of this um, at times, or at least for me, is kind of a real sense of compassion, um, particularly for my students who I think have been struggling and to hear some of their stories as they write to me while they're trying to deal with things like assessments, um, has kind of reminded me of what the interior lives of other people are like and what the situations of other people are like and to try to approach them cautiously and kindly whenever possible. And I think that there's something that can be said about treating our characters kindly, which doesn't necessarily mean not putting them through the ringer in a story, uh, because we should do that from time to time. Um, but it, it can mean, you know, really trying to understand what their viewpoint is, um, not writing off our characters, uh, which is something that I found I did in my first draft. Um, I, I was a little bit heartless to my characters. And now I feel like what I have is a sort of immense heart 
for my characters. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of our session. Uh, so I want to thank you, uh, Joy and Shannon, so much for joining us um, from, uh, from all sorts of different places. I, I suppose one of the benefits of this is this ability to be able to connect in different spaces maybe than we're used to. Uh, and thank you to all of you who've listened to our talk today. There were so many great questions that we didn't have a chance to get to, uh, but I do hope um, that if you haven't had enough and you're still really feeling um, revved up to do some creative writing, uh, that you do, um, you do find ways to support the artists that you love. So go buy their books, uh, go donate to the theater companies that might be suffering at the moment. Um, or if you don't have the money to be able to do those things, maybe send them a message on social media and just tell them that you appreciate them or you miss the work that they're doing at the moment, because I think we can all use that, um, that, extra, that extra little bit at the moment. So thank you so much for coming out today. Um, and thank you, uh, Joy and Shannon. Pleasure, thank you. Pleasure. Thanks so much. Keep safe. Wash your hands. <laughs> exactly. <laughs>